Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, today, it's a pleasure to have uh, Joseph Bradley come here. Uh, he's finishing a PhD from CMU. Uh, in the machine learning department, yeah, and he can talk mm -hmm. about uh, optimizing trade-off for scalable machine learning. Okay. okay, thank you. Right, so, um, be, right as you said, talking about how to optimize different trade-offs of quantities uh, in order to help scale uh, various machine learning problems, and so I'll start out just by talking about what those quantities are at a very baby's level view of machine learning where we'd like to get data, train a model to fit the data using some sort of optimization, and then test the model on new data. And so what the worries I'm going to be thinking about are if we have big data, a lot of it, have a complex model, structured optimization, and all of these difficulties are going to end up feeding into things such as uh, issues such as sample complexity, how many training examples do we need to learn the model, uh, computation, in the optimization during learning, and in the modern world, uh, how to take advantage of things like parallelism to help with that computation. And so these three quantities are going to eventually, of course, feed into the eventual accuracy of our model on the new data. But it's these three quantities which uh, I'm going to be talking about. So in order to improve scalability, you can imagine improving each of these individually. For example, develop methods with better learning bounds, uh, which improve the sample complexity. Uh, look at computation by developing faster optimization methods in the sequential setting. Or say, do parallel implementations of existing uh, algorithms. So what I'd like to think about instead is how to trade these off where, for example, a small sacrifice in computation might lead to a big gain in parallelism. And in the first part of the talk, I'll talk about a method which does this trade-off. And the second part of the talk, I'll talk about a setting and a method where we can trade off all three of these aspects. So our general approach to scaling is going to be to take some complex problem and decompose it into subproblems which are simpler to solve in and of themselves. Then through analysis, we'll look at different trade-offs in uh, this decomposition. And the analysis will actually help us guide how we do those trade-offs in order, uh, do that decomposition in order to optimize those trade-offs. And interestingly, we'll be able to talk about data and model-specific ways of doing that optimal trade-off. So in this talk, I'll start out talking about parallel regression uh, where I'll talk about parallel coordinate descent method, where we can trade off computation and parallelism. And the second part, I'll talk about parameter learning for graphical models, uh, where we look at a method which can trade off all three of these aspects. So first looking at parallel regression. So in the regression problem, <clears throat> we want to predict essentially one label or a small set of labels given a large number of features. For example, in one data set which we look at, the label is a measure of stock volatility, which it turns out you can predict somewhat uh, unlike the direction of the uh, movement in stocks. And we're going to be predicting them from uh, a large number of features, which are small pieces of text from financial reports. The sparsity part, of course, is that we want to explain that label using a very small number of features. And of course, this is very useful in high dimensional settings where the number of features is a lot larger than the number of training examples. So in this uh, part, the problems we specifically look at are lasso with a least squares loss and sparse logistic regression. In general, uh, our analysis is to generalize linear models. So in the sequential setting, there are a whole lot of algorithms which can be used for sparse regression, like gradient descent, stochastic gradient, interior point, different thresholding methods, 
One which caught our eye was coordinate descent, also known as shooting. And it caught our eye because it's been shown to be very fast. Um, there have been a number of theoretical empirical studies explaining this and showing this <clears throat> uh, on many problems. But for big problems where you have millions of features or hundreds of thousands of examples, even this fast sequential method uh, is, may not be ideal. And so what we'd like to do is take advantage of parallelism. So here I'll be talking about the multi-core setting where there's shared memory and low latency. And in ongoing work, we're looking at distributed. But in this, in the multi-core setting, we can think of parallelizing a number of aspects of the problem for parallel regression. First, matrix vector operations. Many methods, such as interior point, um, spend a lot of their time doing such operations. And we could think of using existing linear algebra libraries to do that. However, we found this did not work the best empirically. And I think it was largely because the methods which could benefit most from parallel matrix vector operations were not actually uh, the fastest methods for this particular problem. We can think of parallelizing over examples, such as uh, doing this stochastic gradient method, which has some uh, parallel analysis. But one could argue that using stochastic gradient methods tends to be best when you have a large number of examples, not a large number of features, which is the setting we were looking at. And then finally, looking at parallelizing over features, for example, shooting or, or coordinate descent and parallelizing that. And we asked the, que the question, which I'll explain in a minute, of whether that should be inherently sequential. But of course, it turns out that it's not, and I'll uh, explain why. So what I'll talk about is a method called shotgun, which is parallel coordinate descent for sparse regression. And I'll first show a convergence analysis, which predicts that you get essentially linear speed ups up to a problem dependent limit. And then show a big empirical study, uh, which shows that shotgun is quite successful in practice. So just looking uh, at a little background, our problem is going to be to minimize the convex objective, f of w, where w is this weight vector. And f of w would be the loss and the regularization for whatever lasso or uh, logistic regression problem we are looking at. <clears throat> so for shooting in the sequential setting, uh, the basic algorithm I'm looking at is a stochastic coordinate descent method, which says while you're not converged, pick a random direction or coordinate j and update the weight for j via sometimes a closed form minimization, sometimes a line search. So if this were the contour map where gray is better, and we start at some point, this method would optimize in some direction, pick another direction, optimize in that, and eventually get to the optimum. So in the parallel setting, what I'm looking at is a very naive parallelization where rather than updating a single direction at once, <coughs> excuse me, we'll update on each of <coughs> excuse me, uh, P processors different directions, um, just holding, pretending that we're holding the other coordinates fixed. So for example, in this setting, if we start here, pick two random directions and compute the minimizations in those, and then we add those updates together, we will get right to the optimum. Of course, this is a very nice setting where here we have uncorrelated features and um, the parallel updates are not going to conflict. <clears throat> now, in a bad case with extremely correlated features, if we compute minimizations in both directions independently and then add those updates together, of course, we might diverge. And so you might ask, is coordinate descent inherently sequential? Well, here's why it's not. And this is our shotgun convergence uh, proof, or theorem. And it's essentially stating that if we limit the number of parallel updates, where I'll talk about the limit on P in just a moment, then we get this bound, which states that the distance from the optimum, where W is the weight vector and WT at T iterations, W star is the optimum, that will be upper bounded by this quantity on the, the right, where on the numerator we have quantities such as D, the number of features, 
uh, w star, the optimal weight vector, and w naught, where we began. We're dividing it by the number. <coughs> Excuse me. The number of iterations, t, uh, dotted with p, uh, the number of parallel updates. And so what this is essentially saying is that we're getting linear speed ups since this generalizes a bound from uh, shooting for the sequential setting. So given this bound, which states that if we limit the number of parallel updates, we should get essentially linear speed ups, this limit is going to be essentially d over rho where d is the dimensionality or number of features in our problem, and rho is the spectral radius of the normalized Gram matrix, x transpose x, where x is the data matrix of examples by features. So intuitively, rho um, measures the correlation between features. And with proper normalization of the data matrix, rho will be between 1 and the number of features. So in the ideal case with uncorrelated features, uh, rho will be 1, and that means that our theory would predict we can update all of the uh, coordinates at once, which is what you'd expect. In a very bad case with exactly correlated features, rho will be d, which means that we can only update a single coordinate at once. Yes? Could you go back to your theorem? What happens if you subtract a trillion off of f? If you subtract a trillion off of f? Yeah, it should be the same minimum, and it should be the same convergence thing, but, it, but the right-hand side becomes like huge and negative, and so I don't know how to interpret it. I see. Hmm. So if you subtract a trillion off of f, um, so the losses we were looking at, <coughs> I guess they, um, <laughs> Right, all the losses we were looking at were non-negative. Um, and that should be, I'm thinking of where that would appear. Um, I think that was implicit in our, in our, uh, in our proof. And right, it's not stated here. Um, they, they have to be non-negative. I think. Right. Let's divide f by a trillion and make that term go away. So if you divide f by a trillion, let's see, then I think, oh yeah, then it, then it just scales and it's relative. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Yes? Do you make any smoothness assumption or something like that on f? Because you scale like 1 over t and not like 1 over square root of t. I see. Right. So, um, in terms of the types of assumptions we're making, um, so f is taking the form, uh, we're assuming that um, we can write out essentially a second, a second order Taylor expansion, and that the uh, matrix which appears in the second order term um, is going in order to um, if it's written as an upper bound matrix upper bounding that that matrix is what actually appears as uh, the gram matrix in the next part defining rho and that limit on rho is um, what we're uh, that limit on rho would be a limit on the smoothness so I guess if um, Right, so I, I think extreme values of rho, then um, that rho, the spectral radius would essentially measure um, that smoothness, as I understand. That's so, right, so it would still exist. Um, so, in terms of smoothness assumptions, um, I guess what we're... Even if rho equals d, which means that we can choose p equals 1, right. equals, still, you know that there are some problems for which you cannot do any better than this order of 1 of square root right. of t. So I, I think it's really in what I was saying before with being able to 
upper bound the change. There's an assumption where we can upper bound the change in um, the objective with a second or something which looks like a second order Taylor expansion. And the assumption that we can upper bound it with that is what's encoding smoothness. Um, and right, I think for some problems, certainly you could not do that. Right. Can you go back to the slide again? I, I want to go back to what John said, because I think it still is strange to me. Because if sure. you multiply f by a huge number, then you basically get rid of your w star norm term. So, it's so let's see. <coughs> yeah, from a dimensional analysis. Right, so it just feels kind of weird that you. Right. Um, hmm. So I'm like trying to figure out the proof, so at least we might be able to. Uh, I, un I unfortunately do not, but I think. Um, is there an assumption <coughs> that f is like zero to one or normalized or something? Like right. Uh, this assumption, this theorem, I think, where it would appear perhaps is that actually hidden in th this is really a bound. Um, for uh, the case of lasso. And for general models, there, there should be another term, um, which I think in our paper is like beta. But basically, it um, is a constant which is multiplied by, uh, it appears in that second order Taylor expansion, like bounding the change in the objective. And um, if you multiplied the objective by a huge number, then I think that would essentially appear as um, a beta multiplied by that w star. I'd, I'd have to check, but I'm pretty sure that um, constant, which is sort of loss dependent, um, is multiplied by the w star term. Um, and for example, for, for lasso, it's like 1. For logistic regression, I think it's 4 something. Um, so, so I just kind of hit it here. Uh, but you, right, I think if you multiplied by a huge constant, then it would appear there. I think that's the answer. OK. Right, so given that uh, we'd expect essentially linear speed ups up to um, some limit, we can see how it actually looks in practice. And so if we look at an example data set where here uh, I'm plotting on the x-axis the number of like, carefully simulated parallel updates, and on the y-axis uh, the number of iterations, where both here we have log scales, then if we do a single update per iteration, we require almost 10,000 to converge. Extrapolating linear speedups, we'd expect to lie upon this line. And our theory says we should be able to do about 79 parallel updates before we start uh, risking divergence. And if you actually run this in practice, then you see essentially that where approximately linear speedups, and then after uh, the end of this plot, we start hitting uh, gain divergence. And you see similar behavior on other problems. So the experiments seem to match our theory, uh, which is what we'd hope. So thus far, I've talked about shotgun as this naive parallelization of coordinate descent working and showing how linear speedups up to a problem-dependent limit actually seem to happen in practice. But now I'll quickly show you some results from larger experiments. So first, looking at logistic regression, where our goal is to predict the probability of a discrete label. We compared a small number of algorithms here since there has been uh, a big empirical study before, basically showing that shooting the sequential version of our algorithm uh, is extremely competitive. Uh, but we did take time to compare shotgun with uh, this parallel stochastic gradient method, um, since uh, it was one of the uh, few other um, right, parallel methods with um, which we had not seen tested on these problems. So stochastic gradient um, was just a simple implementation where we estimate the gradient with a single training example 
And of course, it's considered to be very scalable. And we are running on an 8-core AMD Optima uh, 2.69 gigahertz. So just quickly showing an example result. This is actually in a high sample setting. Uh, the high dimensional setting made us look e even better. But in this setting, we had half a million examples, 2,000 features. On the x-axis uh, is time, and on the y objective, where lower is better. And so if we look at shooting, uh, the sequential coordinate descent uh, does seem to do reasonably well. Stochastic gradient, as you might expect, is faster at first, slower later on. Parallelizing it uh, helps a little bit using this method. But then parallelizing coordinate descent uh, helps enormously, and it looks like shotgun uh, is the fastest. So basically, parallelizing over coordinates seems to give big speed ups. And we saw even more extreme behavior differences in the high dimensional setting. Do you know what the sort of it's convex, so, so if you run some sort mm -hmm. of thing like LBFGS, do you know what the true objective minimum is? Right, so for all of these, we, I mean, we essentially ran them. Um, for an extremely long time, and then uh, recorded that um, essentially optimum. And um, then we would do these experiments running these until they got within some percent. So we, would, we actually, I think, tried to compute the optimum using um, shooting. But in if another, uh, that was what we did initially, but then if another method reached a lower objective value, we'd record that as the optimum. So, so 150,000 is really the optimum here? It, or a little bit below that, but right. Um, we, we ran some of these for right, an extremely long time until. So those pairs are from the challenge, or it's your own FGD implementation? It, it's our own implementation, right. Yeah. And this, this is actually a really simple SGD implementation. We also tried ones uh, specifically tailored for um, the L1 setting, but those, in terms of objective value, um, were much slower, uh, even though they got sparser answers, um, just because uh, the, the issues with doing stochastic gradient with L1 um, ended up making them less competitive on these sorts of plots than our implementation. Pascal challenge um, data, like results are public, right? Those optimization challenge, right? Right, so I'm, that's a good question, and I'm not sure what their curves would look like relative to this. That would be good to check. Yes. Again, it just averages the eight cores at the end of the procedure, right? It does. So <coughs> how do you guys track the progress? How do you, how do you terminate each of the cores for conversions? Oh, so the idea is um, at each iteration, uh, suppose we, we stop there, um, compute that average, and that's one, one point in this plot. And uh, so it's essentially, I mean, this plot's saying, suppose we stopped at this moment, then that's what the parallel SGD okay, would look like. So That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so it looks like shotgun is maybe three times faster than shooting or so? I'll show you actual speed up plots in a, in okay. a couple slides. Yeah. Oh, then I'll wait to <laughs> Yeah. <coughs> okay. So then looking at lasso quickly, um, goal is to predict a real valued label. And we, here we hadn't found as many big empirical studies, so we tested a lot more types of algorithms, uh, as well as large number of data sets with sizes varying from you know, hundreds to millions of uh, features and examples. Uh, I don't have time to go into too much detail with these, but I'll show you two of the four classes of data sets we looked at. Um, the important thing to note are what's circled in blue, which is the average predicted number of maximum parallel updates uh, for the data set shown, and I'll show you in each of these boxes. But the important thing is basically note that a very large number of parallel updates could uh, potentially have been done. So in each of these plots, x-axis is shotgun's runtime, y, the other algorithm's runtime. And if something's above the diagonal line, then that means shotgun was faster. So this point is saying that on this particular data set, 
Shotgun took 1.2 seconds. The sequential version, 3.4. So just quickly plotting different methods up here. We have shooting uh, L1 LS, interior point method, which used parallel matrix vector operations, uh, and then a number of other methods. And most of the dots are above the dotted line, uh, so Shotgun did reasonably well. And then on this larger, sparser data set uh, collection, uh, a lot of the methods actually weren't even able to finish in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and so Shotgun uh, looks quite good. So essentially, shooting seems to be one of the fastest algorithms, and Shotgun provides additional speedups. However, speaking of speedups, uh, if we look at the actual curves of x-axis number of cores, which is also in the number of parallel updates we're doing, y-axis the uh, speedup we got, these are aggregated results from all of our tests, and of course, diagonal would be optimal. <coughs> so yeah, if you look at that wall clock time speedup of Lasso on average, um, it doesn't look that great. Uh, and it varied a lot. Sometimes it would be no speed up, sometimes almost optimal, uh, but average was there. But if you look at the number of iterations we're doing, um, it's almost optimal. So it is decreasing the number of iterations. And what we thought we were hitting was, uh, what we believe we were hitting was this memory wall where essentially memory bus is getting flooded. And I think a reasonable explanation for this is that Lasso's updates are very cheap, very little computation per datum loaded. And so it's rather difficult to hold, uh, to hide things uh, like memory latency. And one thing possibly supporting this is that if you look at the logistic regression time speed up, uh, it's significantly better, although still not optimal. And logistic regression uses more floating point operations uh, per datum loaded, and we believe that helps hide the memory latency. Uh, so you had a question? That was my question. Okay, <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, I think that definitely points to the need for possibly more opt Perhaps there are more optimization, hardware-specific optimizations we could make. Um, trying this on other hardware, testing it on other types of losses, which might help hide that latency. Right, there's a lot to. Just so I understand the setting, when you're measuring speed up, you're holding the problem size constant and just increasing the number of cores, or are you also scaling the problem size in, in any way? Um, so this is, each point is the average over data sets. Um, of running that, of the right speed up for that number um, of cores. So it's right. You, you're right. I'm, I'm not, I guess that means that everything is being held constant as we go across. Um, that, that would definitely be interesting. Yeah, the variance in the actual wall clock time speed ups was pretty big. And it would be nice to be able to say a bit more about, you know, what types of data sets. Yeah, that was the best for it. What's the variance of the red line? Uh, I, I don't know the number. I, I know the ranges, which were essentially from 1 to 8. Um, to but eight, then it can be memory flooded. If you got it one time to read, then all eight <coughs> have to read that fast, then they can do it. So I think it depends on this. I'm, I'm not sure, but. I would think it would depend on the dimensionality and the sparsity of the data. Um, and I, I'm not sure. Right. Did you store your data in columns or in rows? Because you're, mm -hmm. you're sort of. You want to access it by column. That's right. So that, that was how we did it, you for sure. You stored it sort of in columns. Right. Okay, but they're still and hitting different columns, and so the memory subsystem is, it has to sort of. It's trying to stream through a bunch of stuff, but it's jumping. Well, sort of. In, in practice, we didn't choose completely randomly. We did a random permutation and then went through it. And there, there were things which we later tried which did help a bit, like trying to carefully um, choose, uh, sort, sort the columns uh, and choose which ones we handled at which time. Um, right, so it, it wasn't completely random. But yeah, there, there were definitely issues with locality. And, and this is a eight core 
just it's standard box. Problem. It's not NUMA. It right. It's just one packet. It, it, mm -hmm. Do you need to see a whole column to actually update uh, a weight? The whole column. Yeah, you, you need to see, like, I, I suppose that so, if the thing is dense, you, you might not have to see. You could, I think that's definitely a question which interests me, whether you can mix the ideas of stochastic coordinate with stochastic gradient. Um, it's not something we have experimented with, really, but it would definitely be interesting. Yeah. So I guess both for a distributed or for like a NUMA system, it'd be interesting if each processor was choosing a column from a, sub, a pre arranged subset of columns. Have you look, done any analysis or looked to see whether it would be just as effective if each? We, we've done that sort of analysis to try to deal with the, I guess you call it the statistical issue of um, conflicting updates where we tried to uh, sort of sort columns based on correlation between them. Uh, we haven't, I guess, done it as much from the more system side, I guess. Um, so in terms of sorting by correlation, there, are, uh, there, there can be some benefit to doing it. There, there is some recent work um, by Chad Scherer, I believe, um, which uh, looked at sort of ex extending this idea and um, combining greedy coordinate descent with stochastic coordinate sort of uh, where, where they did some smart sorting of columns. Yes. Mentioned that I just forgot the, the what's the dimensionality and the number of examples of the problems that you tried to. Uh, so it it varied a lot from hundred to um, hundreds of thousands or millions. I don't think the speed up would would highly depend on whether <coughs> your thing right. is in the cache or not. You know this kind of things and so that and that is definitely so, yeah. Right. Methods, I mean. Your method could shine for like pretty huge data sets where you know single box implementation may not be viable actually to start with. And then you, you As know, far as single box implementations, that I mean that's something we're thinking about now. This was really targeted at multi core. Um, I think in the distributed setting we're having to think about pretty different approaches. Yeah. You didn't experiment with different CPUs. We we tried um, a little bit. There, there was a 16-core, I think, Nellum machine, which we were uh, testing with. We saw um, it, it was a bit better. I, I think it had um, right less issues with cache. I, I, I think but I, I think you have, you know, a lot of this is about memory, yeah. So, so uh, on on chip cache and, and the structure of right. cache and I, I mean, definitely on a more souped-up machine it, with the uh, right. It, it would help. Um, yeah, I think it would be interesting to look at other types of hardware. You're really not that computationally bound. Right. Is that what, I think that's what you're trying Definitely to do. Definitely with yeah. Lasso. Yeah. OK. So um, just to sum up this part quickly, uh, looking at parallel regression, um, talked about shotgun, this parallel coordinate sent, uh, gave an analysis showing essentially linear speedups. Of course, in our experiments, we did not get the ideal speedups. But especially since the sequential version was one of the, mo the best methods for these problems, speeding it up a bit uh, with parallelism uh, made shotgun one of the best methods. So, so we're going back to the themes I talked about at the beginning. What we did was decompose this computation based on different coordinate updates. And we saw that. Basically, even though these coordinate updates would conflict and cause a little bit of divergence, making us do a bit of extra computation, uh, we ended up getting a, a big gain in parallelism. And we could sort of optimize this trade-off by choosing the number of parallel updates based on the amount of correlation in our data. So there's a pretty simple example of this, these sorts of trade-offs. What I'd like to do, if I have time, is talk about uh, parameter learning for graphical models, which is a case where we can actually trade off uh, things in much more complex but beneficial ways. So in graphical models, um, a m motivating example might be, say you want to model user interests or behavior in a social network. And to do this, you might want to, say, model a probability distribution 
over a bunch of random variables x, where each x, uh, say x1, models a particular user, user1. So given a model for the probability distribution over all these random variables, you could ask queries like probability of some set of variables given another, which um, could translate to predicting some user's interest given what you know about others. So the general framework I'll talk about um, are Markov random fields, or MRFs, where, of course, an edge in this uh, graphical structure um, will indicate a direct dependence between two variables. Filling out this graph gives this structure, which essentially encodes our statistical assumptions. And then we'll factorize this model um, by writing it as a product of factors, which I'll write as psi. Uh, and each of these will be functions over small sets of random variables, which will correspond to edges, in this case, or perhaps hyperedges in our graphical model. And so in this, uh, if we fill out the rest of the factors, of course, we have a fully specified probability distribution. And even though I'll talk about MRFs, all of these results generalize to conditional random fields as well. So basically, this setup, of course, is very principled and statistical, principled statistical and computational framework. Uh, there's been a whole lot of work, including a lot from here, and many applications of graphical models uh, showing they are quite useful. So in this, I'm going to be talking about the parameter learning problem, where given the structure, uh, wh or um, given the structure of this and data sampled from P star, which is this uh, target distribution, uh, we'll want to learn parameters, which are the values of these actual factors. So a traditional method using max likelihood estimation, or MLE, uh, we want to maximize, with respect to our parameters, uh, the expectation of our data of the log probability of seeing that data point. And of course, MLE is, in a sense, a gold standard in that it's optimally statistically efficient. And in the infinite sample limit, uh, no method is really going to be better than it. But of course, the problem is that in this loss, you have this probability over the full distribution. And computing this probability is difficult because of this proportionality constant. And estimating that proportionality constant requires inference over the entire model, all of x. And this has been shown to be provably hard in general. Of course, being tractable in some cases, such as if the graphical structure is a tree. So given that inference is hard, a question is, can we learn without intractable inference? And in parameter learning, there, has been, there have been a bunch of works uh, often using approximate inference or approximate objectives. But the problem is that most of these work lack really strong guarantees for general uh, types of models, especially uh, if the model is not a tree or the like. And so what our solution is going to be is to use as a baseline MLE, which, as we stated, has optimal sample complexity, but requires a lot of computation, and as we'll see, is difficult to parallelize. I'll then talk about pseudo-likelihood, which is this method which essentially breaks the problem into a separate optimization for each uh, variable in your model. And as we'll see, it has higher sample complexity, but much lower computational complexity and easy parallelization. And actually, our analysis gives the first finite sample complexity bounds for general models. I'll then talk about composite likelihood, which is a method which ranges between MLE and pseudo-likelihood, allowing you essentially to choose substructures in this graphical model to have a more structured estimator for the parameters. What that will let us do is, in many situations, choose this estimator structure in order to optimize these trade-offs and get the best of sample complexity, computation, and parallelism for many problems. So first to motivate the idea of pseudo-likelihood, MLE is essentially estimating this entire distribution, p over x, at once. And what pseudo-likelihood is going to do uh, is start by observing that if you take 
um, the statistical assumptions encoded in the graph. This is essentially saying, for example, the probability of one variable, x1, given the rest of the graph, or its neighbor, is proportional to the single factor, psi 1, 2. So you could imagine doing regression, uh, which we talked about in the first part of the talk, uh, in order to get an estimate of this one factor. You can imagine doing this for every variable in your model. For example, probability of x2 given its neighbors, uh, and estimating that via regression would give you estimates of these other factors. And you can note that we run into some issues with uh, multiple estimates of these factors, but you can actually show that you can average these in log space and still get good guarantees. So what I'll call this is pseudo likelihood with disjoint optimization, where you regress each variable on its neighbors, that gives you factor estimates. And then if you have duplicates, then you average them together in log space. I'll also talk about pseudo likelihood with joint optimization, which is essentially the same problem, but you do parameter sharing when doing the optimization. And this is actually how pseudo likelihood was originally presented. The key is that this formulation allows tractable inference, where for each of these subproblems, we have the probability of a single variable given its neighbors. And in order to estimate this probability, or to compute this probability, um, by our model, we just have to compute this proportionality constant by summing out a single random variable, in this case, x1. So to compare MLE with pseudo-likelihood, MLE estimate the full model at once. Pseudo-likelihood re essentially regresses each variable on its neighbors. MLE is in going to be intractable in general. Uh, pseudo-likelihood will be tractable. MLE has been shown to be optimally statistically efficient, uh, but people have shown that pseudo likelihood is often empirically successful. MLE uh, has had finite sample complexity bounds, meaning people know its behavior in the finite sample case. But before this work, uh, pseudo likelihood did not, and so had often heard it referred to as a sort of heuristic. But we'll see, we can cross that off. Yes. When you say a model versus, so the model is the same, right? right? So how is the inference becoming tractable in one case and intractable in another? I mean, the model is the same. So you're thinking so, about the model, right? So I'm not. I'm talking about the inference required during learning, not the inference at test time, and that is actually a, raises a number of interesting questions. Um, at learning time, though the loss you're optimizing doesn't have the probability of the full distribution in it. So in a sense, so, you change the model itself. Um, it's an interesting, it's, it's hard to know exactly how to phrase it. I would phrase it, I guess, as changing the loss. And optimizing that loss does give us guarantees with respect to our original model. Um, we can, we can yeah, right. you can change it. Actually, change the model, and that would be called a dependency network. You could just oh. give up on the graph. <laughs> <I> mean, the <laughs> Th way that I is see, another option. <laughs> I mean, the way I see it is you are constraining your, your potentials, which essentially is equivalent to changing a model. That's how I'm seeing it. But right. Um, it may be just the same model, but you formulate a different uh, loss. So yeah. Serving it, for different purposes. I, I guess it's hard to say. I mean, you're not, maybe you could phrase it either way. Can you go back? Can you go back to where you were? I'm, I'm not sure what the model would be. I guess which you would, yeah. which would be, listed by this loss. We'll go back to, to, to the log. You said you only change the, the training only for training time, not testing time. Uh, which there, this there. Oh, you're not okay. actually optimizing that up. When pseudo likely, you're not doing that. Right? That's true. Okay. Right. You, uh, okay. Does that does that mean you're changing the model? I mean, it's, I guess it's a semantic. I, don't, I wouldn't call it changing the model loss. Right, I mean... Right, you're changing the loss there, of the training parameters, but you have to change the model. There, there might be something interesting to be said, like this is actually optimizing MLE with respect to this model, but I'm not sure what that model would be unless it's... Right, I mean, the close... I guess <laughs> dependency networks seem very relevant, but I'm not sure if that's... Uh, right. Um, for small oh. scale problems, suppose you construct some artificially very small 
from which you actually can compute the likelihood. Do you compare pseudo likelihood versus likelihood? How much difference is it going to be? Um, the ultimate so, likelihood. Right. I, I will show comparisons between like how accurate the parameter estimates are <coughs> from pseudo likelihood versus optimizing. Uh, versus optimizing MLE or something, okay. if that's your question. Uh, actually, I'm more thinking about if you use a pseudo likelihood, you change the loss function, uh, right? The way you interpret it, and then you estimate the parameter. Now, from the parameter that you estimate, which is not as good, then you can compute the likelihood for those parameters that you estimate through pseudo likelihood. Uh, yes, you can. And then the question is how much difference it is. For small scale problem, you probably can compute those. Right, and that, that's something I'll show. Okay. Yep. Good point. Okay, so where were we? Right, so talking about sample, finite sample complexity analysis of pseudo likelihood, um, the result actually, I'll phrase in terms of MLE. So first, sample complexity result for MLE. Um, which will be very similar to the pseudo likelihood one, would look like this. To achieve a given error epsilon, uh, we need at most n training examples, where n is uh, a around this amount, where here we have epsilon, the L1 norm of the parameter error, and that's actually normalized by the number of parameters. R is the number of parameters. Delta is this probability that this bound doesn't hold, very common in these analyses. And lambda min is an eigenvalue condition, which I'll discuss a little bit later. But first, what I'd like to show is uh, the bound, analogous bound for pseudo likelihood, which you notice is essentially the same, except that actually this lambda min value uh, is going to be different. So before I explain that, uh, I want to point out that, yes, as I said, this is uh, the first finite sample complexity bounds for very general models. And when you add this together with tractable inference, uh, for many classes of MRFs this act and CRFs, you can actually show that this uh, implies pack learnability. And basically, what you need to do is control how that lambda min value grows with respect to whatever problem uh, parameter uh, you're defining your class of models with respect to. So given this, what I need to do is explain lambda min. Yes? What does error mean here? Error? So um, it's the uh, L1 norm of the parameter um, error. So it's, um, we, we have an optimal parameter vector. And, and, right. and it's also normalized by 1 over r, the number of parameters. So lambda min, we'd expect the number, we'd expect the number of examples to need to be around 1 over lambda min squared. So we expect this value to be important. And I won't take too much time to ex talk about this, but essentially it's an eigenvalue condition which measures the curvature of the objective, where greater curvature in this objective is going to make it easier to learn. And the important thing really is how it varies for MLE versus pseudo likelihood. Essentially, MLE is going to have larger lambda min, implying lower sample complexity, but of course recall requires more computation. Pseudo likelihood will have smaller lambda min, higher sample complexity, but of course less computation. So we have this sample computational complexity trade-off. And speaking of trade-offs, I'd like to point out one more, which is specific to pseudo likelihood. Now recall that pseudo likelihood is essentially taking each variable and regressing it on its neighbors. But I mentioned you can do it both with joint optimization with shared parameters and disjoint, where you average duplicate estimates later. Uh, and the bounds I've been showing have actually been for joint optimization, which will have lower sample complexity uh, based on our bounds. And with disjoint optimization, we get slightly worse bounds on the number of samples required. But of course, that's completely data parallel. And so we have something of a sample complexity parallelism trade-off. So finally, looking at the predictive power of the bounds, <clears throat> on the left here is lower sample complexity or lower error for a fixed number of samples, on the right, higher. And so we'd expect to see MLE being the best in this respect, then pseudo likelihood with, disjoint opti with joint optimization, and then disjoint. 
And so what I'm plotting here is a synthetic example where we can compare with the ground truth, x-axis, number of training examples on a log scale, y-axis, the parameter error, lower being better. And so you can see with max likelihood, we do indeed learn, decreasing the error. Pseudo likelihood is a bit worse, especially at the low sample regime. And pseudo likelihood with disjoint optimization is a bit worse, just as we'd expect. So this sample complexity at tuning actually occurs in practice. But the, 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 what is the proof of length for the disjoint optimization? Like you have, you have basically, you're basically like different cut out of your model, right? Yeah. They, have, they have nothing to do with each other apart that you get the same, to see the same data. <coughs> and, and, and they're very different like dependence assumption, they don't have the same right. sets of variables. And so they, it seems that they could get at very different potentials. There are definitely cases with, where that does happen and where that doesn't. And it, it's essentially actually going to be this like lambda min value, which, uh, control, which like hides all of that behavior. Um, in the actual proof, um, you could imagine the disjoint optimization proof as looking like a proof showing that simple regression works, and then uh, basically showing that if simple regression works, each regression will be reasonably accurate. And so averaging their estimates together will still be reasonably accurate. And our proof just used a simple. They won't be accurate for different models. They won't be accurate for the same problem. I tell you so x1 depends on x2, and then I tell you x2 depends on x3. In terms of the. Um, so it, it would be for the same model in the sense that both problems would be using the same set of statistical assumptions, um, where the graphical model is encoding these statistical assumptions, and each problem would be still working with that same graphical model, although with a different loss, I agree. But the guarantees would be with, with, with respect to the same model. Yes. One thing I'm not able to resolve is how would this pseudo likelihood method resolve, like, uh, you know, uh, basically what they call uh, not attractive potentials, where you know x1, x2 should be should be different, x2 and x1 should be different as well. And I mean, you have basically a kind of you understand what I'm saying? Like an Ising model. Yeah, right. basically, yeah, like an Ising model where where everything is not attractive. Mm -hmm. In those cases, your pseudo likelihood will completely fail. Hmm. So, in that case, I'm not sure what the eigenvalue condition would behave as. Um, we definitely tested it on models where there were both. Um, I, I guess we did not actually, I think, test it on models where there are completely rep all repulsive potentials, only on ones with a mix and with all attractive. But it. People have looked at pseudo likelihood for mm -hmm. inferences on networks of images, right. which is an icing model. And they have actually found that when the, poten the potentials are not attractive, mm -hmm. pseudo likelihoods do diverge quite a bit. So right. So, look into. I mean, I think that I, that's something I would like to test on some uh, data with the ground truth. Um, I think if you have a model which is, right, maybe completely repulsive. I, I don't know. I'd have to explore that more. If you have some repulsive like problem areas, then I think actually the method I wanted to talk about next would be quite useful. So can you show again this? What, what type of value do you measure? Is it on the original? Model? Right. It's um, <coughs> should know my slide numbers. Um, right. It's so for MLE, it's the minimum eigenvalue of the Hessian of the. Um, uh, objective the log probability over all of x at the optimum. For pseudo likelihood, it's this minimum over each variable um, of that eigenvalue condition for that local loss. But for the true, for the true likelihood uh, minimization, right? Not mm -hmm. for, for what you're actually optimizing. So lambda m is a measure mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the MLE problem. Yeah. Or is it a measure on your So your this is problem? both. Uh, are with respect to um, like I include the target distribution. Um, but I mean, in terms of the loss from which this Hessian is computed, that is 
loss specific. That, that's different for the two. Um, but both involve expectations over the target distribution. Yeah. So, so can that be zero then? Is it because I, I mean, I think it's the same. So there are. It, it's actually the the <coughs> smallest non-zero eigenvalue. Non if it if you do have z but you're zero. You're saying that in the case of like infinite data, the pseudo likelihood is going to converge to the same parameters as so the MLE. That that's a simplification. Really, it's that. I mean, in in all cases, if you have an overcomplete representation, really what you'll converge to is um, so, something which can be, you know, is of the same rank and can be transformed, um, but is, is going to be equivalent in terms of the yeah, loss. Yeah, so the parameters might not be the same, but the, but the probability distribution represented right. by the two sets of parameters will be sure. the same. I, right. I think you'd always need a, right, That's, would, would Wait, if you have intractable one frames, surely the learning has multiple local minima. So there's something, something <coughs> odd going on. Here. Intractable inference? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, 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 if the underlying graphical model is, 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 is not acyclic, aren't there multiple sort of local minima for the learning? So when I talk about MLE, I'm not talking about using approximate inference. Um, mm -hmm. So, there's so it would still be convex. Um, if you threw in some some types of approximate inference, then certainly you'd you'd run into problems with non-convexity, um, right? But uh, what about for have latent variables? It seems surprising. Right. So for and I should have say perhaps the types of models I'm looking at are like log linear MRFs and CRFs. I should have said that okay. perhaps. Suddenly my head is yeah, uh, okay. If you have latent <laughs> variables, that is definitely an interesting question. And it's something I, and as well as the semi-supervised case, <coughs> which I um, can't really talk about here, but um, am, would like to look more at in the future. And I, there's some simple ideas, which you can immediately read from this composite likelihood method, which I wanted to talk about later. But um, yeah, it, this is not immediately applicable to that. Yeah. So, uh, other than through something like EM or. Right. So, right, we had seen that basically um, the ordering of these in terms of error and sample complexity is what we'd expect. Uh, looking at further at the predictive power of these bounds, you can see that um, in terms of sample complexity, we have our bound like this. And what I'd like to say is that show is first ignoring the log term, which is, as you'd expect, not that significant in practice, and fixing the number of training examples. What you might expect to see if this bound is reasonably tight is that the error um, increases at approximately 1 over lambda min. And what I want to argue here is that lambda min is important in controlling the difficulty of learning. So here, if you look at uh, 1 over lambda min, so harder problems going to the right, and the actual error on the y-axis, uh, you can indeed see that for what we'd expect to be easier problems, we get lower error for a fixed number of training examples and vice versa. So lambda min does indeed seem to be important in controlling this difficulty of learning. Um, controlling it. So basically, generate a, a whole bunch of random uh, models, and each of those models is a point on this, and generate enough that we get points along the whole line. <laughs> yeah. So have you thought about using a different objective function here, like uh, the error of the final joint probability rather than the L1 error in parameters? Because at the end of the day, it's the probability that we right. care about, not the parameters. So our analysis. Um, sort of does it in two steps, where we bound the parameter error given number of training examples, and then um, the loss in terms of the uh, parameter error. That second bound is not that interesting, but I do think that going directly from bound on the loss to the number of training examples required um, would definitely be interesting to do. Um, it wasn't super clear how to do that uh, in the analysis, but that would definitely be valuable. Yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, can I can I ask when should I go until? <laughs>
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Good. So, uh, in terms of what this lets us do, uh, given that we have this lambda min value, which seems to control the difficulty of learning the Mellian pseudo likelihood, uh, what I'd like to say is how this varies for different types of models. And so, what I'll do is compare this lambda min ratio between MLE and pseudo likelihood. Um, so, first, looking at model diameter. And here I'm just uh, looking at chains as they increase in length to the right. And on the y axis, this ratio between MLEs, lambda min, and pseudo likelihood, where basically higher means that MLE is better. You can see that other than end effects, um, the performance of pseudo likelihood, as you might expect, doesn't change that much as chains get longer. So I'll call that not a problem scenario. In terms of factor strength, meaning uh, basically the magnitude of parameters or how strongly variables directly interact with each other. As you increase that going to the right, that is on a log scale, you can see that this ratio actually does uh, shoot up. So you can see that for very strong factors, um, pseudo likelihood can actually run into problems. Finally, for node degree, as you increase the degree uh, of a node, this ratio again increases, albeit not as quickly as with factor strength. So we might call that a problem scenario for pseudo likelihood. But what I'll talk about is that we can often fix this um, using a method called composite likelihood. So MLE is essentially estimating the entire model at once. Pseudo likelihood is essentially taking each variable and regressing it on its neighbors. You can imagine the natural generalization of instead take a chunk of variables and regress them on their neighbors. And you can see that this varies, this generalizes both MLE, where we have a single chunk of variables, and pseudo likelihood, where each chunk of variables is a single variable. And so what we show um, are similar sample complexity bounds and bounds for joint and disjoint optimization, just like you saw for pseudo likelihood. They take the same form, so I won't show them again. Uh, but I do want to emphasize that we analyze structured composite likelihood, meaning that we really paid attention to how these components were structured, especially with respect to our model and data. And that's something which, surprisingly, you haven't seen that much uh, in previous literature. Uh, in previous literature, often these chunks of variables were just, for example, all sets of two variables or three variables in your model. And it really benefited us to look at the structure. So the obvious question is, how do you choose these estimator structures? And what we do is look to our experiments with pseudo likelihood for guidelines. For first, we limit each, each component to trees so that inference within that component will be tractable. We'd like to follow the structure of our model in order to avoid those failure modes of pseudo likelihood where for example, if we have a star structure, we'd like to cover it with a single component. If we have a strong factor, we'd like to cover it with a single component. And we'd also like to try to choose large components or minimize the number of components uh, in order to be intuitively closer to MLE than to pseudo likelihood. Do you have to know beforehand uh, which factor will be strong or do you adapt? That, it's an interesting question and it's sort of ongoing work how you can adaptively, for example, get a rough estimate of your distribution in order to choose a, be a much better estimator and then get an accurate estimate. Um, right, un unless you have some kind of prior knowledge. Yeah. So for example, given this grid, we might choose these two combs to cover it, where each is a component in our uh, composite likelihood estimator. And it sort of follows our guidelines. Uh, to the right. So showing some uh, examples, experiments with this, uh, here it's a synthetic grid model where um, we are learning with a fixed number of training examples. And here I'm going to show increasing grid size to the right and on the y-axis comparing the log loss of one method versus MLE. So here it's saying that pseudo likelihood is just as good as MLE for a single node since it's the same. But as the grid gets bigger, um, MLE uh, is actually going to do better pseudo likelihood worse, as we'd expect. 
Now, if we use these two combs for composite likelihood, uh, we make a significant gain. Um, but what's really the clincher is that if you look at training time, MLE takes a lot longer than pseudo likelihood. And using this structured composite likelihood, uh, but limiting ourselves to trees, doesn't actually make us require more time for training. How yes? Do you compare when you use uh, approximate inference but maximum likelihood estimation? Okay, so this is actually using approximate inference. With exact, it was not comparable. Um, here, it was with Gibbs sampling. And there is certainly a lot of tuning which could be done to, yeah. Sampling is not the fastest, right? Um, I think it varies based on the problem. I mean, certainly you could do like belief propagation or something. Um, and yeah, it's, it would definitely merit like further comparisons. Um, it, it, there's a lot of tuning to be done there. I think. Yeah. training time is based on deep sampling. Yeah. Okay. It is. Yeah. But you're using exact for the pseudo and for the composite, you're using exact? That's right. Great. So for this, uh, composite likelihood essentially lowers sample complexity without increasing the computation, which is what we'd hope. Um, and I do want to emphasize that we estimated, uh, these estimators were tailored to the model structure. and. I won't talk about it here, but it's also useful to tailor it to the correlations in the data, uh, the strong factors, where you um, need either expert knowledge or some adaptive method. So to sum up here, looked at finite sample complexity bounds for general models, and basically showed first that pseudo and composite likelihood are not heuristics. You can get real bounds for those. And this allows pack learnability for certain classes of models. And then we looked at structured composite likelihood, where we gave some guidelines for choosing estimator structures based on failure modes of pseudo likelihood, uh, especially trying to tailor those estimators to the model and data. So it let us do um, this sort of decomposition, which was uh, model specific, and get the best of all these uh, trade-offs in certain cases. So what I've been trying to argue is that we can scale learning by using different types of decompositions, which let us trade off quantities like sample complexity, computation, and parallelization. And these decompositions used model structure and locality. And the trade-offs were tailored to the model and data. So for example, in parallel regression, we uh, decomposed over coordinate updates. And we were able to choose the number of parallel updates uh, according to correlation in our data. In parameter learning, uh, we decomposed the loss into subgraphs, essentially. And we're able to tailor that decomposition according to both the original model structure and uh, the strength of factors in our data. And then I also looked at structure learning in the thesis where we saw some similar trade-offs, uh, but I uh, didn't have time here. So there are a number of future work things I'd like to uh, look at. First, in terms of parallel regression, I've just talked about the multi-core setting. But I'm very interested in the distributed setting, where you have limited communication, uh, where you both want to limit the number of messages you need to send, as well as uh, the size of those messages. And they're really taking advantage of sparsity in those messages is a challenging problem. I'm also interested in heterogeneous parallelism, where you might have multi-core plus distributed plus perhaps GPU. And you'd like to parallelize over multiple facets of your problem, for example, both examples and features. There are also a lot of interesting questions when we start talking about, for example, parameter learning, use phrased as this, where you have more structured objectives. And for that, I think a really interesting question is, how to do partly joint optimization with composite likelihood. And there, I think um, methods such as like alternating directions method and multipliers uh, might be very applicable to uh, this. So another thing I'd like to look at in parameter learning is I've sort of talked about some guidelines for how to do these trade-offs. But there's a lot of work which still needs to be done in order to create sort of an automated learning system which can automatically choose the structure and parallelization strategy. So there are a lot of trade-offs. 
in terms of sample complexity computation, but also things I haven't talked about, such as in parallelization, how you balance the number of components you can parallelize across versus the amount of communication required if you're doing partly joint optimization. And I think an interesting way of phrasing this might be, for example, graph partitioning, where some questions are, how do you even estimate or compute this lambda min, given a model and estimator, cheaply, of course, and how do you balance these various objectives and constraints in this problem in order to choose estimators and divide its components across machines? So in the interest of time, I'll just get through this and mention that there are a number of applications I'm very interested in. First, in terms of social network modeling, um, I think that there is a lot to be done in terms uh, of applying sort of graphical model um, formalisms to social networks. And there I'm really interested in both in first generative models, which model both the network structure and the semantic content, like text and images, in those networks. And there I think um, there are a lot of interesting questions about both scalability up to social network size um, and in terms of how to jointly model those aspects. I'm also interested in looking at uh, some uh, work in temporal modeling and how to modify the methods I've talked about for the semi-supervised case. I've also done some initial work which I'm interested in continuing, continuing with machine reading where uh, um, an example goal might be to build a probabilistic knowledge base from text on the web. And there I think difficult questions are if, say, you phrase this as uh, a big graphical model, how you do focused learning and inference within that model, uh, since you really would need to prioritize uh, with that scale, as well as how to do active learning in order to keep building this knowledge base, um, but minimize the amount of human supervision and interference required. So with that, I'll leave a summary uh, of this talk here. And thank you very much for listening. Right. I've looked at it some, but I have not done a full comparison. And I think it's, yeah, it's a really interesting case where it sort of mixes ideas of, from several cases, like stochastic gradient with uh, approximating the objective. And um, it, it would definitely be interesting to look at. Yeah. Um, at what is the impact of the different uh, optimization strategy you propose on the generalization error on the problem? Let's say I have this for a distribution I estimate, but the thing I really want to do is ask a question about you know, what the text you want to read. So maybe I don't need to model the distribution perfectly, right? Right. So uh, you have evidence that you could have a lower sample complexity to which you give a generalization error. Um, right. So in terms of, you're asking about going more directly from some sort of loss yeah. to Yeah, so I, I, I guess a bound so, is hard, but I think uh, right. a kind of uh, unpick evidence is also uh, right. um, it, it is definitely an interesting question. <laughs> I, I would like to look into it more. I think somewhat relatedly, um, would uh, one initial thing I've been thinking about is how to make these bounds not sort of like wide sweeping bounds over all your parameters, but really be more parameter specific, where you know you can imagine some parts of your model are easy to estimate and some are hard, mm -hmm. and that in and of itself would let you perhaps get better bounds with respect to the loss you care about, but also would perhaps I, I may not have fully understood your question, but I think would help in cases where what you really cared about was a particular part of your model and wanted to estimate it well. And then you might have sort of model part specific bounds. So I'm, I may have missed part of this. It's for the composite likelihood, the parallelism is done by doing you know, different parts simultaneously. That's right. Yeah, that's that's how I've been thinking about it. OK, so in that case, the degree of pseudo likelihood will be more parallel. That's right. Right. Okay, so do you have the kind of curve to show 
you know, what kind of uh, you know, speed up you get for that part, not the earlier you show right. the error, uh, I, I don't. I think that in terms of disjoint optimization, um, the, cur the sh curves I showed really are immediately applicable since that's completely data parallel. In terms of cases where you're doing joint optimization but distributed, um, that, that's something I'm very interested in looking at. Um, and there I think really also more analysis is needed in terms of saying how joint optimization behaves. and um, with the hope that you don't really need to um, make it fully joint, but can, you know, essentially stop early. Um, and, right. And how about directly graphical model? Do you explore that at all in terms of... I have not. In terms of parameter learning, I guess that's, in a sense, more straightforward since you don't have to do inference over the full model. Um, in terms of structure learning, that's very interesting. In structure learning, I was just looking at undirected. Yeah. Thanks.